Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the second annual Crossroads Speaker Series event. My name is Rodney Grabowski, and it's my pleasure to serve as UCF Senior Vice President of Advancement and Partnerships and the CEO of the UCF Foundation. And I'm so happy to see all of you here today to come out and have, uh, be a part of this presentation. I joined UCF uh, this past September, but even before I came here, I was impressed with the excellence of this university and the incredible commitment UCF has to access an opportunity in this community. It's been an honor to join Knight Nation, and I'm excited to be a part of this transformational university that is unleashing the potential of one of the best higher education communities in the country. And as I've gone around and have visited with volunteers and donors and alumni, there's a common theme. There's a love for UCF. There's a love for Orlando and this region. And they are all asking the question, what can I do to help? And having been in some other communities around the country, this spirit of cooperation and commitment to our region is something that I have not found everywhere that I go. And so I'm hoping all people that live in this area really appreciate the gem that we are as a community. And so to begin today's program, I'm pleased to introduce UCF's president, Dr. Alexander Cartwright. Since he began at UCF in 2020, President Cartwright has focused on leading UCF toward becoming the university for the future, a place committed to excellence for its students, faculty, and staff, and to producing innovative research and inspiring creative works that provide solutions for some of society's greatest challenges. As a first-generation college student whose journey to higher education was not traditional, President Cartwright is dedicated to inclusive excellence that empowers students from every walk of life to earn success. Please join me in welcoming UCF 6th President, Dr. Alexander Cartwright. Thank you, Rod. It's really a pleasure to be here, and it is truly a pleasure to have you here, Rod. So thank you for joining UCF. As Rod mentioned, this is our second year gathering for the Crossroads Speaker Series, where we explore the intersection of business and philanthropy. For UCF, philanthropy that comes from the wealth generated by entrepreneurship is transformational. It drives innovation and excellence, unleashing the potential of our students, faculty, and of the Central Florida community. UCF itself is a living example of how partnerships and entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurial spirit can propel success and improve the lives of individuals, communities, and even those around the world. What this institution has accomplished in less than 60 years is extraordinary. The scale and the speed of our transformation, our rise in excellence, and the impact we have had on our region and society would not have been possible without our partnerships. The vision and leadership of the Central Florida community that created what we now call UCF is amazing. Our 89 founding families invested in the vision to help make our main campus a reality. UCF's Rosen College of Hospitality Management, now the number one hospitality program in the country and number two in the world, is also a partnership. Our groundbreaking academic health sciences campus that includes our College of Medicine, Lake Nona Cancer Center, and is the future home of our new College of Nursing building is built on partnerships. And just a mile from here, thousands of students, faculty, and staff live, work, and learn in the heart of our city at UCF downtown, which is anchored by the Dr. Phillips Academic Commons and uh, Academic Commons on the campus we share with Valencia College. At UCF Downtown, Dr. Phillips Charities and UCF have provided an academic home and new opportunities for hardworking students who want to learn, earn success, particularly for those in some of our region's most economically disadvantaged areas. These are just a few of the examples of the many partnerships UCF enjoys thanks to the generous philanthropy of individuals and our business community. 
And while all of them have built facilities in some examples, it's not just about building a structure, but it is about building a community. These partnerships are about shared hopes, dreams, and goals for our region and state. They are about working together to create efficient, high-quality pipelines for talent to fuel growth and innovation in the industries that matter most to our economy, now and in the future. Whether it's doctors and nurses, video game designers and computer programmers, teachers and social workers, aerospace engineers and AI specialists, or immersive experience experts and hospitality management managers, we are collaborating with Central Florida's business community to meet the workforce needs. And we are preparing our students to launch fulfilling, high-impact careers that create broad-based prosperity for our region. The entrepreneurial spirit thrives at UCF. No matter what we have achieved to date, our community is always looking towards the future and towards getting even better. We take nothing for granted. We innovate in the classroom and in our business practices. We focus on research and creative works that impact society, and we remain positively connected to our community and partners. And as Rod said, we are building the university for the future, a place where students from every walk of life and, and, and where our faculty in every discipline can unleash their potential and earn success. Dr. Phillips Charities and UCF have been partners in impact since 1968, the year we held our first classes. 54 years and over 353,000 alumni later, we have accomplished a great deal together. And UCF is not alone in benefiting from the partnership with Dr. Phillips Charities. Since 1954, Dr. Phillips Charities has contributed $222 million to our region, supporting education, healthcare, arts and culture, children, and social services. Everyone who lives and works in Central Florida is better off thanks to the legacy of Dr. Phillips. And so, before we get to today's conversation with Jonathan Tisch, I'd like to invite Ken Robinson, President and CEO of Dr. Phillips Charities, to the podium. Ken, on behalf, yes. Ken, on behalf of the students, faculty, and staff of the University of Central Florida, I want to sincerely thank you for your partnership and for your leadership. Together, we've watched UCF, Orlando, and Central Florida grow to become beacons of innovation, entrepreneurship, and economic progress. Without question, Dr. Phillips Charities played a vital role in this success, and we are all so grateful, and we look forward to many more things that we will do together. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, President Cartwright. We're going to let you uh, write all of the press releases for Dr. Phillips in the future. It's well done, very well done. Um, and we're very proud to partner with UCF in the Crossroads series where business meets philanthropy. Um, if you look at Dr. Phillips' uh, business philanthropy, they're part of our ethos. They're our character. They're everything that Dr. Phillips, his wife Della, and Howard Phillips really wanted this organization to be. Um, before we were a nonprofit profit giving, um, it was built into our culture. And as um, Dr. Cartwright mentioned, he has us at $222 million. We had a board meeting last week, and I think we're at about $235 million now in giving to Central Florida. Um, early on, when Howard Phillips uh, made the first gift to uh, UCF, it was for their inaugural ball in 1968. So we go way back, and since then, we've been involved in everything from baseball to first-generation college students, which we think is uh, extremely important. One of the main reasons we gave to the Dr. Phillips campus downtown so they could see and grow up in the shadow of a university. 
Um, we've been involved in the medical center. We've been involved in so many different parts of it. And it, it, it's a rewarding thing to do to be involved with a university like uh, UCF, where you can invest into a freshman and watch them grow into leaders in your community. It makes such a world of difference, and uh, we're proud to be part of it with UCF. Um, pretty soon, as in like this Thursday, and uh, President Cartwright won't let me say anything today other than this, and I'm like a kid with a Christmas gift. I want to open it up and give it to everybody. But uh, we're excited to say that this Thursday we'll launch our next partnership with UCF that is focused on the health and well-being of our entire community. The next endeavor together will be announced around 1.30 to 1 p.m. at the Wave Hotel at Lake Nona, adjacent to UCF's medical campus. We're excited about this announcement and uh, stay tuned and look forward to it. Um, last year's inaugural event was with Clarence Otis. I can't think of a, a better person to have started this with. You look at a gentleman who grew up in Watson, the, outside of the LA, and rose to become the chairman of Verizon, rose to become the president of a Fortune 500 company. Um, his story was exceptional. And there's a wonderful story that John Tisch has to share with us today. Um, it, and it, there's such great business partners, great, such, such great philanthropists in, this, uh, in, in the entire country. Um, and the work they do is something we want to hear and the conversation we want to build upon and continue to build upon in this speaker series. Um, with that, I'm going to introduce someone who has the most pressure all day, which is to introduce her boss, and that's Barbara Bowden. Um, she'll serve as a moderate, moderator with Jonathan Tisch. Uh, Barbara is the area managing director for Lowe's Hotel and at Universal Orlando, where she oversees the operation of some of the Orlando's premier and preferred hotels, including Lowe's Portofino Bay, Hard Rock Hotel, Lowe's Royal Pacific Resort, and Lowe's Sapphire Falls Resort. She's been part of Central Florida uh, hospitality community for 38 years and serves on several boards, including the Central Florida Hosp Hotel and Lodging Association and Visit Orlando at UCF. Barbara is a member of the Dean's Advisory Board and an inductee of the 2022 Rosen College Hall of Fame at the Rosen College of Hospitality Management. So please join me in, in welcoming Barbara Bowden. Thank you, President Cartwright. Thank you, Mr. Robinson, for your remarks, as well as continuing to forge a strong partnership between your organizations, truly a partnership which benefits our entire community here in Central Florida, so thank you. It is now my honor to introduce Jonathan Tisch, a longtime friend and honored speaker of Crossroads, the intersection of business and philanthropy. Jonathan is chairman and CEO of Lowe's Hotels & Co. He is also co-chairman of the board for Lowe's Corporation. He is one of the most influential people in the area of travel and tourism, while also being a leader in corporate citizenship and social responsibility. Jonathan, please join me. Again, Jonathan, thank you and uh, welcome. Thank you for being a speaker at today's event. I'm sure this will be a lively and thought-provoking conversation. We look forward to hearing about your personal and professional experience leading purpose-driven companies, particularly as it relates to philanthropy and community building, and of course, near and dear to our hearts, being a good neighbor where you live and work. So with that, we'll get started. Thank you, Barb. Can you give us a quick overview of how you built your career and what your role is today? Well, first, let me thank the University of Central Florida, Dr. Phillips Foundation, for this very kind invitation. How do you feel about interviewing your boss? <laughs> <laughs> I feel great, John. <laughs> <laughs> We've known each other a really long time, so no pressure whatsoever. That's right. So, I'll take it back and tell my story because it's a bit of my family story. And <clears throat> it's one that truly speaks to the value system of our nation and the American dream. I was born in Atlantic City, New Jersey in 1953. My family had a couple hotels there at the time. 
And they had actually started with a summer camp in a community called Lakewood, which is southwest of New York City. They had, my father and uncle had grown up in Brooklyn with very little money. They had read about the opportunity to lease this camp. They didn't know anything about how to run a camp, how to really run a business, but they said, we'll figure it out. So they leased the summer camp. It was near the end of World War II. It was successful. The family that owned the camp also owned the big hotel, which was called the Laurel and the Pines in Lakewood. And the family came to them and said, look, you guys have done a really good job leasing, excuse me, running the summer camp. Do you want to run our hotel? So they said, sure, why not? And that led to the Tisch family entering the lodging industry. When I was living in Atlantic City as a very young child, we had five hotels. This is in the heyday of Atlantic City when it was the summer resort for New York City, for Philadelphia. And then in 56, 57, my father and uncle and my grandparents, because my grandmother was one of the most remarkable individuals who really didn't excuse me for one second, take any shit from anybody. <laughs> and she was the, the spiritual leader of the family at the time. And they decided to take a real risk and build a hotel in Bal Harbor, Florida. It was 96th Street. It was prior to development going north of where mm -hmm. the Fontainebleau, the Eden Rock, South Beach, and everybody thought that they were out of their minds. 700 rooms, 40,000 square feet in meeting space, literally in the middle of nowhere. And the hotel opened in 1957 and proved to be quite successful. Our family moved to Miami for a year, then we moved to New York. And the impetus for us moving to New York along with my aunt and uncle and my four cousins was that at the same time that they were running the Americana of Bell Harbor, they, my father and uncle, were buying the controlling interest of Lowe's Theaters. For those of you that have gone to business school, you know that it was one of the first acts under the Sherman Antitrust Act where MGM and Lowe's were one company. The government said, no, that's not gonna work. MGM would make a movie, it would automatically go into a Lowe's Theater. So the government separated the companies, they became two public companies, and they started buying the shares of, the, of this Lowe's movie theater company, and they weren't interested in showing movies. They were interested in the land underneath the theaters to build hotels. So all the families moved up to New York. And in 1963, the Summit Hotel opened on 53rd Street and Lexington Avenue on the site of the former Lowe's Lexington Theater. And that's when the family started to expand with other properties in New York. At one point, we had eight hotels in New York. And then when, in the late 60s, early 70s, when my father and uncle bought Lowe's Corporation, excuse me, bought CNA Insurance, that's when it became Lowe's Corporation. So today I am co-chairman of the board of the parent company. I am chairman of CEO of Lowe's Hotels for another seven weeks. <laughs> I am, I've announced, I announced two weeks ago that I am stepping down as CEO of Lowe's Hotels and have asked my nephew, Alex Tisch, to become president and CEO, and I will become executive chairman of Lowe's Hotels. It's a seamless transition. I've been doing this for 35 years. The good news, and I see some very familiar faces from our wonderful organization, the good news and the bad news is you guys aren't getting rid of me. <laughs> I'm not going anywhere. Just a different title. I went to school in Boston. I went to Tufts University. When I was a senior there, I decided, I, I shouldn't say this in an educational institutional setting, but I decided I wasn't really in the mood to go to classes anymore. I got an internship at the NBC station in Boston. I taught myself how to shoot and edit film and videotape. And when I graduated from Tufts in May of 76, WBZ offered me a job and I spent three years there as a cinematographer producer doing sports, public affairs, and children's programming. Moved back to New York in the summer of 79 and started as a sales rep at Lowe's Hotels in January of 1980. And here we are some 42 years later. All right.
John, you referenced that uh, time in your career uh, that you spent in television. So does that influence, or how does that influence uh, your work in hospitality? It influences what I do, Barb, because I believe in thinking about hospitality as a show. Maybe a Broadway show, maybe it's Hamilton, which is right next door to us, and I got to see these two amazing theaters before we started today's conversation. Beautiful, beautiful space. <clears throat> when you think of the idea of putting images out there, we do that for our guests. We have 26 hotels, we have about 11,000 team members, we are building a few new properties. We opened one in Carl Gables two weeks ago. We've got one under construction in Arlington, Texas, 888 rooms, 250,000 square feet of meeting space. People ask me, Mr. Tish, how do you feel about the future of the meetings industry? And the quick answer is, we are building a hotel with 250,000 square feet of meeting space. That should answer your question, how I feel about the meetings industry. Or I may go back to being a TV producer <laughs> if, it, if it doesn't work. So the whole idea of what makes what we do at Lowe's Hotels, trying to not meet expectations, we try to exceed expectations. And that is done through many different touch points. Many of them are through people's vision, they're through their senses, it's the food that they eat, it's the smells of the hotel. And I, having the responsibility of being a TV producer, of being a cinematographer, of being an editor, I had to train my eye to tell a story. And that's what our properties do, is we tell a story. When you're editing a TV show, and one edit might be a jump cut, one edit doesn't flow as smoothly as it should, that's not a problem. It's because what you're doing is you're putting together thousands of edits. When you walk into a hotel, you are processing thousands of points of information. What does the furniture look like? What's, what are the uniforms? Where's the front desk? Can I go to the room now in today's world just using my phone? That's all part of what we do in presenting an image. Now, as you well know, you work for some larger companies before you fortunately join Lowe's Hotels. We're really small. The big guys in this industry are huge. The Marriott's, the Hilton's, the Hyatt's, the Intercontinental's, the Accor's. These are global organizations. Marriott has a million and a half hotel rooms, a couple hundred thousand team members. We have 26 hotels, 11,000 team members, but we really put a lot of thought into who we are as an organization, how we want to be an employer of choice, and the image of our properties. And that's where I spend, as you well know, because I'm here all the time, that's where I spend a lot of my time, is trying to uh, separate us from the competition with unique properties that have a certain look to them that seamlessly fit into their environment. And I learned a lot of that when I was a TV producer. Thank you. John, we're here today to talk about the intersection of business and philanthropy. You were so instrumental in the creation of Lowe's Hotel's Good Neighbor program. Tell us about the inspiration for that program and the value that it, you think that it's added for Lowe's Hotels. This whole notion of being part of the community is vitally important to us. And what's great about the lodging industry, there are so many things that, that make me so proud to have spent my entire career lobbying in DC, lobbying in Albany, lobbying at City Hall in New York about the value of a strong travel and tourism industry. But what makes me feel really good is how our industry understands their roles and responsibilities in the communities where we operate our properties. We came to that understanding about 25 years ago, put together the Lowe's Hotels Good Neighbor Policy. We were one of the first national organizations to come out with a unified program to be able to discuss ways that we support the community. And the thinking is actually pretty simple. If a hotel isn't doing well as a business, you can't pick it up and move it. You can't shut the front door. We are also very large users of labor. 
our labor tends to live within the communities around our properties. Our properties are supported by our neighbors when they do social events, when they hold meetings, when they have family gatherings. So it's incumbent upon us to understand our role in the community and work together to strengthen the places that we do business. And once again, our industry is really good at this. But as we continue to grow, as there are needs in every community where we, we as an industry operate, which is everywhere, then it becomes even more incumbent upon us. And the Los Hotels Good Neighbor policy outlines how when there's food left over from a banquet with the permission of the client, we give it to a food bank. When we're renovating and we have dressers and, and beds and sofas, we give them to homeless shelters. We make our meeting rooms available for community-based organizations to have their gatherings so they, they can discuss what's important to them. And I think in today's world, with the complicated issues that we face on a daily basis, all of these issues become even more important as we continue to look for labor. That is a huge issue. As I mentioned a moment ago, we want to be an employer of choice. And people who are coming out of such dynamic pro programs as the Rosen School at UCF, where we have about 275 active students, graduates of the Rosen School that are part of our team at the Universal Hotels, uh, Los Hotels at Universal Orlando. We have 35 members of management that are graduates of the Rosen School. These kinds of discussions become even more important because young people today, they have a lot of choices. They can either stay home in their pajamas and get on Zoom, or they can hopefully migrate back to the office. But they're not going to work for a company where they don't respect the value system of that organization. So we work even harder today to articulate a vision of caring, responsibility, decency, transparency, of letting people be who they want to be, of letting them think original thoughts, and most importantly, treating them with respect. Thank you. It's kind of a related question. So in your book, Citizen You, Doing Your Part to Change the World, you embrace the concept of active citizenship. Tell us how you define active citizenship, what influenced your view, and uh, how does one put active citizenship to work in their lives? The original view for my siblings, my four cousins, and we were basically raised as one family, these were thoughts that were inculcated into us as kids from my parents and my aunt and uncle. The family grew up, as I mentioned, with very little in Brooklyn due to the incredible intuity, excuse me, intuitiveness of my father, my uncle, my grandmother, my mother. They created something very special. And from a very early age, we understood that we had a responsibility. I am not a big fan of the phrase giving back. <coughs> to me, that phrase is too transactional, that maybe I'm just a jaded New Yorker and I see too many people that write a check and maybe they put on a tuxedo or a long dress and they go to an event and they think that they have given back. Well, sadly, the challenges today are bigger than all of us. And the only way we're going to face these challenges is to understand our responsibility to the community. And the whole notion of becoming an active and engaged citizen has to start at a very early age. I am so honored to have endowed what is today called the Jonathan Tisch College of Civic Life at Tufts University. And I, I made the original gift. And then when I got married 15 years ago, my wife and I continue to support the work there. And Tufts is now at the center of the conversation about what it means to take these young people in their formative college years and how to teach them to become an active engineer, how to become an active and engaged doctor, how to become a citizen lawyer. These kinds of conversations need to start probably in the K through 12 programs, but certainly when you're in college and to 
have been involved from the inception of such a, a program that, at Tufts that now we are doing incredible research in terms of youth voting. There was an article in the Times yesterday quoting the research that the Tisch College is putting out about the midterms and youth voting. So this is something that has been really important for us as a family, important for me, and that's why I wrote three books, and the third one was Citizen You, to have people understand they have a responsibility, especially people who have achieved a level of success, success in their lives. You have to understand that you have a role and you have a responsibility. Thank you. What are you most proud of about the company as it exists today? I think being able to talk to people such as yourself, 11,000 strong, that care about their position, that we show respect to them, and hopefully they will do the same for us as their employer. And to have gone through the last couple of years, to have witnessed, and once again, we're small, but I was very involved in the conversations in my role as Chairman Emeritus of US Travel, to witness a shutdown of the global travel industry, the largest employer in the world, to have days where we had pretty much zero revenue. I'd be lying in bed and I'd be staring at the ceiling and my wife would say, why are you staring at the ceiling? I said, well, we used to have 11,000 team members. We've had to furlough 10,000 of them and we have zero revenue. We have no revenue right now. And to have worked through those issues as a company as an employer, as an industry, is incredibly fulfilling. And as you know, because I'm here on a regular basis and walking through the properties and talking to the young men and women who are part of our team is incredibly gratifying and very fulfilling. When I look at the properties that we have, 26, not big, but when you look at the campus a couple miles from here and what we've created over the last 25 years with this incredible partnership that I've worked on for 25 years with Universal and now NBC Universal and now Comcast. When I think about what we're creating in Texas with our partnership with the Texas Rangers and Live by Lowe's Arlington, which has been open about three years, and then we're building this other 888 room hotel, Lowe's Miami Beach, a lot of these properties there was tremendous interest in, but we found a way to make the deal. And under the notion of being a good neighbor, we also strive really hard to be a good partner. And there is nothing worse than a partnership that doesn't work. There is nothing better than a partnership where each side has the ability to say that it's a good deal, that they're getting out of it what they expected, and there are very few issues. And I'm very, very proud of what we've created here for 25 years in Orlando. Is there anything you wish you had done differently? There are hotels that I wish that maybe we had approached differently, that I would love to be part of this organization. But in terms of my personal path over the past 42 years or whatever it's been to, to today, I don't think so. Uh, I'm not big on looking back. I do like to think about the future, especially now in my new role as executive chairman of Lowe's Hotels, <laughs> <laughs> not CEO anymore. And in case you haven't noticed, I am happy. You, you have a certain smile yes, when exactly. you say that. <laughs> you're, you're in very good shape, don't worry. So to look to the future, to think about other opportunities. I get asked all the time, if I wasn't doing what I'm doing today, what would I want to have had a career in? And it's a very simple answer. I wish that I, I love what I do. I think about being an architect. And I love the design process. I love the creative process, which goes back to my years in TV. I love working with the architects that have done an amazing job for us, the interior design firms. 
uh, and, and as Barb and our other team members who are here this afternoon know, I sit in every chair, I pick every fabric, I pick every lamp, I pick every tabletop, I pick every curtain, and people say, why, why are you so obsessive? And I said, it's just, that's my job, is to ensure that our properties have a certain look and a certain feel. And I just love creating things from a, a blank piece of paper. And, and that's the part of the job that I love, and also being responsible for the culture of the organization. Thank you. You've said that while you can be committed to your own success, you need a mindset that creates success for others. How do you develop that mindset, and how do you put it into action? That was discussed a lot in the first book, The Power of We, and the full title, The Power of We, Succeeding Through Partnerships. Understanding that you can't be all things to all people, that uh, you are good at certain things, you are not good at other things, and that it is your responsibility to help others, no matter what your role in an organization is. I know what I'm good at, and I know what I'm bad at. And I've been able to backstop the areas where I don't think I have strength with other men and women who have done an incredible job. And this notion of partnerships, and Dr. Cartwright used that word many times in his opening remarks about this university in this community with the Dr. Phillips Foundation. Those kinds of partnerships are how we become successful, and I'm not just talking about financially successful. Okay. I'm talking about emotionally successful, about being successful as a team member, being successful as a parent, as a partner. It's those kinds of partnerships that are vital to us moving forward. In The Power of We, we talk about three main partnerships to be successful in what you and I do for a living. We need to create a partnership with our clients, our customers, our guests. They pay the bills, they come in. When they check in, they, they sort of have an expectation. As I said earlier, we need to not meet that expectation. We need to exceed that expectation. And then when they check out, when they get their bill, they are ma making a calculation. They have a bill that says, you owe Lowe's Portofino Bay Hotel $350. You are saying, did I get $350 worth of value? If the answer is no, you're not coming back. If the answer is yes, hopefully you will come back and hopefully you will tell a family member, you will tell a friend, I was in Orlando, I stayed at Portofino, it was amazing. So we can create that success through, once again, the physical aspects of the property, and hopefully we have really nice hotels. But the main way we know we're successful or try work hard to achieve that success is through the second group that we need to partner with, and that's our team members. I have an office on 61st Street and Madison Avenue. I am not making beds. I am not cooking, thank God for our guests. <laughs> I am not bringing bags to the room. I am not a lifeguard. I am not a housekeeper. But we've got 11,000 women and men who do those roles. And they're the ones that create that relationship with our guests. And we are nothing without them. So that's the second partnership we talk about in the power of we. The third we've discussed already is community. Because once again, we need to be a vital member because they just deliver a lot of business to us. And inherent in understanding these partnerships is the responsibility you have for others. Uh, if you're fortunate enough to have a, be in a, a loving, committed relationship and you can have that with your partner, that's pretty amazing. If you can do that with your kids, and I have three of them and I am blessed, that's pretty amazing. If you can do it with your colleagues, if you can do it at the workplace, if hopefully you're going back to an office and you can do it with the people that you see every day, that's pretty special. And it takes work. Anything that is successful takes a lot of effort, but I think it's incredibly rewarding when 
you achieve that kind of understanding for yourself and for the people that you surround yourself with. Thank you. John, you referenced uh, Lowe's Hotels & Co. Uh, joint venture with Compact, Comcast NBC Universal. How has that partnership evolved? So when I give speeches, I say, thank God for my wife, for my kids, and for Harry Potter. <laughs> <laughs> It has been an incredible relationship, and this goes back 25 years when some of you may remember that Universal was still owned by Lou Wasserman, and this was when it had been announced that Universal theme park in Orlando was expanding, City Walk was gonna get built, Islands of Adventure was gonna get built, and that three hotels were gonna be developed to create a resort destination. This is 25, 26 years ago. And it was at this time that Universal was sold to Seagram's. Seagram's was the gigantic liquor company, distribution company out of Canada, owned by the Bronfman family. And Edgar Bronfman Jr. was a very good friend of mine. We grew up together in New York. And I called him once the deal had closed and I said, I don't know how far you are in your due diligence. Once again, this is before devices, this is before cell phones. I said, but eventually you're gonna come to the realization that once you start to focus on Orlando, that you're building a new theme park, that you're building an entertainment area called City Walk, and you're building three hotels. I said, I don't know the deal that was made. I'm just telling you because I read the trades and I saw this in the trades. But if you want to talk about that, we can talk about it. Calls me back two weeks later. He said, you're right. We're building three hotels. I said, yeah, I knew I was right. Uh, after the, uh, a year went by, lots of negotiations, lots of ups and downs, lots of conversations, and we ended up making a deal to build three hotels. First one being Portofino, which was under construction already. The second was Hard Rock. The third was Royal Pacific. And through the various transitions of ownership of Universal, from Seagram's to Vivendi to GE to now Comcast, the three hotels are now eight hotels. The original 2,400 rooms are now 9,000 rooms. I hear that there's a new theme park being built in Orlando. <laughs> I've read about it a little bit. And so we're very excited about what our partners are doing there. And it's been absolutely remarkable. And some of the people that I have been dealing with for 25 years at Universal are still there. We still work seamlessly together to create these opportunities. David Bartek, who one of your colleagues and his team, it's remarkable. We were at lunch today and, and we were talking about, fortunately, business has come back in, in such a, a strong manner. But there are days where we have 30,000 people staying in our campus. And from what I hear, we're not the largest in town. I've heard that there might be another company <laughs> that has a few more rooms than us. We're friendly competitors. But just for UO, for the Lowe's Hotels campus with our partners, on any given day, we could have 30,000 people staying with us. And your colleagues and yourself do the most incredible job of minimizing challenges, of ensuring seamless experiences. A lot of times, and I'm sure all of you in your various businesses are dealing with this, the worker shortages are real. That is a, something that we all have to think about and where we're gonna find team members in the future. And to see the numbers, to see the return of travel, to see people wanting to get out, to understand how important travel is to our psyche of being, of, of experiencing different things, of getting out of our own backyard, and to have created over the last 25 years this incredible partnership is truly, truly fulfilling. Thank you. 
We are at our last and final question, and one that I know is near and dear to your heart. And so it is. We have some students with us today who are on the cusp of launching their careers. What advice do you have for young people just starting out in business and reaching their own crossroads of philanthropy and business? Well, I have, I've been very fortunate. To, I speak at a lot of colleges. I was on, I was telling Dr. Cartwright, I was on the board of Tufts University for 31 years. The Rosen School at UCF is an amazing program. There is another program at a university called NYU <laughs> called the Jonathan Tisch Center for Hospitality <laughs> Management. It's nice too. So we, we graduate some good kids also. <laughs> but I, I speak on colleges all the time. I love the ability to, to speak to young people, the future leaders of our businesses and our industry and our communities. And I tell them something that goes back to your question, Barb, about my years in TV. Maybe you, you are studying hotel management. Maybe you are an engineer. Maybe you want to be a doctor. Maybe you want to be a lawyer. Maybe you want to be an accountant. And you spent four years. You spent two years at a community college. You've gone to grad school. You put in the time. But what happens if you don't get the job that you want when you graduate? You shouldn't be upset about that. You learn from every experience, and I tell people, just take a job. Any job that interests you, take a job, because you're gonna learn something from it. Who knew that in May of 1976, when I graduated from Tufts University, that spending three years as a TV producer would help me build hotels all these years later? You learn from every experience. We can plan. We can have ideas, we can have goals, we can have dreams. They, sometimes they work out, sometimes they don't work out. None of us know where we'll be tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. So learn from every experience. When I started at Lowe's Hotels in January of 1980, I had a boss who also told me two things. First was that everybody has a boss. No matter what you do, you report to somebody. Yes, I may be the executive chairman of Lowe's Hotels, but we, we're a public company. We have a, a board of directors. Everybody reports to somebody, and it is in your best interest to make your boss feel good. And if you can deliver wins along the way, he or she will feel good, and will, so will you. The other thing this guy taught me 42 years ago, and this is way before email, way before devices. This was the old way of communicating either with a typewriter or a letter. God forbid you should handwrite a letter. <laughs> Never start a paragraph with the word I. Because when you start a paragraph with the word I, you are immediately saying to the person who is reading now an email, a text, that you are more important than they are. And think about it, when you go back and the minute you leave here and you get on your device and you're gonna start communicating with the outside world, you have to train yourself not to do that. And it teaches you about communication, it teaches you about the power of we, not I, of going from being a society of people who say I to a society of people who say we and it will make a difference about how you think and will change your view of communicating with other people. Thank you. John, on behalf of myself, everyone here from Lowe's Hotels at Universal Orlando, Dr. Phillips Charities, UCF, thank you for spending time with us and for the insights that you've shared. To members of our audience, thank you very much for coming to this year's annual Crossroads, the intersection of business and philanthropy. I said it wrong. <laughs> Philanthropy. Thank you very much. Have a Thank great you. evening.